love, I love Christmas. Not as much as I used to when I was a kid, but I love Christmas. It's a, it's a great time of the year. It's a great season where we can just enjoy uh, a lot of fun. But we can also focus on the reality of Christmas. You know, it's a very familiar story for probably a lot of you. Very familiar. And uh, as I think about the Word of God and even as... Um, I've got his name. Um, Hayden. Even as Hayden took us through an Old Testament sort of uh, journey this morning, there's so many passages in Scripture that uh, are just quite rich. Some you uh, would say, they're my favourites. Some you'd say, I've, I've actually never read those ones. Some you've heard many sermons on. Some you've uh, never heard a sermon on. But we know that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to discern a whole pile of things, bones and marrow. It's, it's powerful. You know, God's Word is, is God sharing His heart with us. It's a love letter from God to us. It's, it's profitable to us. You know, in 2 Timothy, it talk, in one, uh, 2 Timothy, it talks about it's profitable for us in all areas of life. It's fresh bread. It's powerful, exciting. We don't always feel that when we read it. But I want to read a fairly powerful Christmas message this morning. Passage. It's from Matthew 1. You mightn't have read this in much detail over the years. Matthew 1 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. This is riveting stuff. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amimadab. Amimadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. This is fairly exciting stuff. How often do you read that and really meditate on it? Probably not a lot. But this goes on for another 42 generations from Abraham to Jesus. Do you want to hear the rest of it? No, no, no we won't go there. But what's amazing is this chapter has been used by God in amazing ways around the world. You know, there's some tribes, and I've read about this, I haven't experienced it, but I've read about this. There's tribes that have been totally converted because of the genealogy. Because they were a tribe that was very steeped in ancestors. And initially, one particular story, this uh, missionary was in a tribe. He translated Matthew. He left out Matthew 1. He thought, that's not important. And there was zero connection. One night he thought, have I wasted my two years here? Or whatever it was. And he said to the uh, translators he was working with, well, let's do Matthew 1. We might as well complete Matthew so we can say, at least we've given him Matthew. They're in a longhouse. And so he starts translating this. And he noticed that there was a hush came over the whole longhouse. Normally there's a lot of commotion. And everyone started to gather around him and he thought, what, what's going on here? Are they going to lynch me or what, what's happening here? And uh, after he had gone through it, he said to the translator, what's going on? And they, he, they said, this tribe, which we're a part of, we thought that this was just some religion you'd made up. We didn't realize it had a history and an ancestry because we are a tribe that is based on ancestry worship. We go all the way back to generations. That whole tribe got converted through Matthew 1. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know, I read this, uh, these passages this past week. I started to laugh. I thought, this is absolutely bizarre. Because what's really strange in these verses is there's four women mentioned. There's four women. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth... 
and Uriah's wife. Doesn't even tell her Bathsheba, it's just Uriah's wife. And and this is this is amazing because women's names were never ever recorded in Jewish genealogies. It was always men. The Jewish bloodline always dealt with father, son, grandson, always. No records were ever kept regarding the women. Women, as you probably would know in that day, in that culture, and as in many cultures today, considered very low, chattels, property, there to produce kids, there to serve. That's extremely low. That's the culture that Jesus came into. Jesus elevated women. Very low. And yet here we have four women mentioned in the ancestry of the Saviour. I just find that amazing. And the thing is, they weren't considered top-of-the-class women. (laughs) They were all Gentiles. So there's no Jews there. They're all Gentiles. Tamar was a Canaanite. Rahab was from Jericho. Ruth was a Moabitess. And the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, was a Hittite. Why on earth did Matthew include these in the ancestry? Why did God have Matthew do that? Well, let's have a look at them. Tamar, verse 3. Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. If you want to read the story, it's Genesis 38 on this one. It's a fairly wild story. And um, you've probably never heard a sermon out of Genesis 38. Probably a chapter you won't have read in church, but now you will read it, won't you? Go and read Genesis 38. Not now. But Judah is one of Jacob's 12 sons. He marries a Canaanite, has two sons, Ur and Onan. Ur's wife was Tamar. Ur was a wicked guy. Uh, The Lord killed him. So the brother Onan has a duty to his brother. And uh, he's got to then take Tamar as his wife. He's got to give her kids. That's a duty for the brother. Onan's actions with Tamar were considered evil by God. So God kills him as well. Tamar then moves into into her father-in-law's house, into Judah's house. And she immediately feels like, I'm never going to have kids. I am a waste of life. That's what made them worthwhile. They have kids. She disguises herself. And she pretends to be a prostitute. And she goes to the town gate. She deceives Judah, her father-in-law, and gets her to have sex with her. This is the uh, MA section of the Bible. She gets pregnant. She avoids death and she has twins through one of which the line of Christ flows. (laughs) That's amazing. I just think, wow. She deceitfully had sex with her father-in-law And her son is in the line of Jesus. And she gets mentioned in the official line. Not hidden under the carpet. I just think, far out. But one thing that God screams to me out of this is grace. The grace of God. God is a God of grace. God says, I am a God who is for broken people. Who is for the outcasts. Who are for the I am for the ones who don't fit. They are the ones that I welcome into my family and I use for my kingdom purposes. <laughs> Go figure. But that's grace. And isn't that us? <laughs> we enter into God's family by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But primarily we don't deserve it, we don't earn it, we can't pay it back. Just a gift of grace. <laughs> And, and if you reflect on that long enough, you think that is, that is really unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Our sin, Tamar's sin did not stop God's grace. Our sin is the reason that you and I experience God's grace. There's no need for grace if there's no sin. Grace is for sinners. You know, God loves you. And please hear this. God loves you no matter what you've done. He redeems you, he welcomes you, 
accepts you, elevates you, delights in you, has a picture of, it, of you on his mantelpiece and says, this is my beloved son, my beloved daughter. I love them. A pearl of great price. And he wants others to know, just like he wants us to know how Tamar has been accepted here, that you are accepted and celebrated as his child. You know, so when I look at Tamar, one of the things I believe very much is that she is there to reveal God's grace to us. We are in the family of God by his grace. And then we move to Rahab. Salmon, the father of Boaz, verse 5, whose mother was Rahab. The story is in Joshua chapter 2, a very well-known story for a lot of you. And when we talk about Rahab, we talk about Rahab the harlot or the prostitute. What a great definition for her, far out. You know, we know the story. Joshua sends 12 spies into the land and two of the spies uh, meet up with Rahab and she hides them on the roof and uh, the authority sends the authorities the other way looking for them. And Rahab says, I know the Lord God has given you this land. We have heard about your God, about what he has done, and we are terrified. So these, uh, these um, people in Jericho, these Jericho people, they're terrified. Show kindness to me and my family. Spare us. You know, she knew the Israelites were going to take the city. She knew they were dead meat. Your life for our lives. Put a red cord out of the window and anyone in your family that is in that house when we attack will be saved. It happened. And you know the story. The walls fall down. They walk around the walls. Walls fall down destroyed the city and every living thing, but they spared Rahab and her family. And not only that, Rahab and her family then become a part of the Israelite community. They're welcomed in. <laughs> it's bizarre. They're welcomed in to dwell with God and his people. And, and she even gets uh, a, messy, a, a mention in the heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11, verse 31. By faith, here it is again, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. See, that whole city of Jericho knew about God, but she did something about it. You know, it was really her faith in action. They said, you put the red cord out and anyone that's in that house will be saved. She had nothing to lose. There was a sense of hope that she and her family could possibly be saved. So she had to put her faith in what they said. She had to put her faith in the red cord hanging out the window. And she was literally at the end of a rope. She wasn't hanging on the cord, but she was at the end of a rope. She had to trust. It was impossible unless God worked a miracle here. And for some of you, you may feel at times you're at the end of your rope. Need a miracle. We all put our faith in something. We all put our faith in something. Not a matter of the size of our faith, it's what our faith is in. That's where the key factor is. Where is our faith? Where is our hope? God says, not just when you're at the end of the rope, but at all times, trust me. Trust me. And I want to ask you, what are the other options? What are the other options? They're not flash. You know, faith is an action word. Trust is an action word. It's an ongoing action word. We don't put our faith in Christ here and then sit back and watch. It's a continual journey of faith that we're on with God. Sometimes we do have to just trust God for the miracles. And sometimes they come through as we want and sometimes they don't. But we still keep trusting God. You know, we've been saved through faith in Christ. We've been saved even as we celebrated communion through the blood of Christ. Nothing we've done. You know, if you're not a Christian here today, think about this. No one deserves salvation. I mean, Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. 
not as a result of good works so that we can't boast about it. It's a gift. So Rahab was saved by grace through faith. It was a gift of God. She was welcomed into the community of the Israelites. She was welcomed into God's family. And she is there in the royal ancestry to reveal to us that we come into God's family by faith. By grace through faith. Nothing to do with our background. She was from Jericho. And she became the great grandmother of King David. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> Just wild. And then the next one we have mentioned is Ruth. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obviously, the whole book of Ruth, four chapters. Beautiful love story of Ruth in the Bible. Uh, Ruth was born under a curse because she was from Moab. She was a Moabitess. And in Deuteronomy 23, it says, No Moabite or any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord even to the 10th generation. No Moabite or any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord even to the 10th generation. So Ruth, this very woman that the law shut out, has found herself in the royal ancestry of Jesus. <laughs> Just bizarre. So the story goes, there's a famine in Israel. You know anything about famines? Droughts? Yeah, not this year, but you do know about it. Naomi was a Jew, uh, lived in the Bethlehem area. And she and her sons went to Moab to try and get food. There's no food in uh, Israel. And they met Ruth and she married one of her sons, one of Naomi's sons. Naomi became her mother-in-law. Uh, she married a son who was an Israelite and he then died. And Naomi, Naomi then decides to go back to Bethlehem. And Ruth chose to go with her mother-in-law back to Bethlehem. She said, where you go, I'll go. I'll stick with you. And remember, single women back then were very vulnerable. No, no support. They were very vulnerable. And she says, all right, I'll go back with you. And then Ruth has a divine appointment with Boaz when she's out taken the wheat from the edges of the paddocks. You remember the story, you might remember the story. And Boaz thinks, who's this woman? Has a divine appointment. I love divine appointments. And in verse 12 of chapter 2 of Ruth, Boaz says, May the Lord repay you, Ruth, for what you have done in staying with your mother-in-law, Naomi. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Beautiful picture. So now R Ruth has been accepted by God. So even though the law of God was against her, even though the law of God was against her, she experienced his mercy. She threw herself on the mercy of God as embraced and is embraced. She was without hope, but she receives the grace and the mercy of God. Once again, unmerited. Doesn't earn it. Boaz is starting to enjoy this relationship with Ruth. But he goes through the due process and he becomes her kingdom and redeemer. And that's another sermon in itself. He marries her and he has a son, Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse, who is the father of David, King David. So Ruth is David's grandmother. Wow. Excluded by a curse from God, but now she is included through a whole pile of divine interactions. And she's able to get, dwell with God and with his people. Mercy and grace is right there. And she gets a mention in the royal line in Matthew chapter 1. You know, we need to remember that nothing except our choice keeps us out of God's family. We responded, many of you responded to God's grace and mercy and were welcomed into his family. But some of you may not be in Christ at this point. And nothing except your choice keeps you out of the family of God. You know, I just find it really surprising how God works amazingly 
in people's lives to redeem them. You know, if you think back on your own story of redemption, uh, numbers of you had families who were in Christ. And you may think, well, I just came by osmosis into, the, into Christ. Doesn't always happen, does it? You start to make some choices along the way. And we have to stay making good choices. Can you think back on the people who are involved in your redemption story? Some it was family. For some out of the blue, a friend invited you to church. I don't know what your story, I know some of your stories. I don't know all, but it's good to reflect on our redemption story. How God orchestrated different things. And when I reflect back, I just I can't help but just be overwhelmed by the goodness and the faithfulness of God. You know, just in terms of how it all happened. I, I was brought into a Christian family, you know, but I remember having to make some decisions at the age of 19 that could have had me go this way or that way. And praise God for probably the only time in my life God spoke to me almost audibly as that loud. He said, you can't do that. Okay. Keep thanking God for your redemption story. It's not an accident. It's a good story. And then the fourth person, the fourth woman, woman mentioned in this uh, Matthew 1 is the, the wife of Uriah the Hittite name was Bathsheba she did have a name but they don't mention it here verse 6 Jesse the father of King David David was the father of Solomon whose mother had been Uriah's wife so the story you can read in 2 Samuel 11 and 12 and uh, King David it was the golden age of Israel's history really good time they were uh, they were champions there was a war on David wasn't in the war he was actually having a bit of a nap at his uh, castle goes up onto the roof looks across sees uh, a beautiful woman having a bath on the roof just there thinks well she looks all right gets her to come over she comes over she sleeps with him or he sleeps with her she gets pregnant and then uh, Uriah is one of his key mighty men he's out fighting the war and uh, David thinks, Farad, I'm in trouble here. Um, so he gets Joab to send Uriah home. And he says, Uriah, you're a great fighter. Go and sleep with your wife tonight. Have a, have a night off. But Uriah, he, he doesn't do that. He sleeps in the doorway and says, I can't do that. When everyone else is out here fighting for their life, I can't do that. So he heads off. So David heads to plan B. And he says to Joab, put Uriah in the toughest part of the fighting Basically, so he'll get killed. So he, he murders him. Adultery and murder. And then he takes Bathsheba as his wife. And then we have the prophet Nathan comes in and tells a story about a little ewe lamb. You know the story? Some of you know the story? You know, this guy's got a massive herd of sheep. This one's just got a little ewe lamb. person comes in, goes to visit this guy with all the sheep, and he says, oh, let's have a party. Goes and kills this little ewe lamb and cooks it up. And David's like, you've got to be joking. That, that, that guy should be killed. You are the man. But the good thing about David is he immediately acknowledged it. He immediately confessed it. Immediately repented. Cost him his family. A lot of his family went through the tubes. Nathan said, you're going to always have trouble in your family. There's going to be killing. There's going to be the sword. It's always going to be ripping your family apart. You see, when we sin... We are forgiven. As soon as we can, we have, there's a forgiveness that's built in through the cross. But the consequences of sin keeps going. The consequences keep going. And by the grace of God, sometimes it doesn't have as many consequences as others. The consequences can really knock us around. So anyway, in uh, this story, Solomon is then born to Bathsheba. Not that baby that she was pregnant to then. Um, I was just thinking about Bathsheba, you know. Some people might say, oh, what'd she sleep with David for? I mean, the guy's the king, for goodness sake. Great pressure on her. But yeah, she slept with him. So what are some of the insights that come out of these four women found in the genealogy of Jesus? I guess everything about these four women's stories reveals again God's mercy, 
grace and forgiveness. And for us too, that's our story. We don't compare ourselves and say, well, I didn't do that or I didn't do that. By the grace of God, we are in his family. And I want to also say that you are not defined by your past. You're not a victim. You're not defined by your present either. You can make choices. You know, we might read that as Rahab the harlot. Seems like a big definition over her. But she's in the, the hero of the faith. You are not defined by your, your, by your past. God renews us. God says, I've got a new, new story for you to run in. New story here. God can redeem you, transform you, and use you in his kingdom. Now, I think of a young guy who used to be at our church years ago, and uh, I was talking to him one time, and he had uh, been in a situation where he got his girlfriend pregnant, got married, and he just said to me, you know, my life is really tainted. He said, like, I can never be a leader of a church or anything. I said, mate, that's not how it works. Mate, God is all about redemption. All about redemption. And redemption means releasing into new journeys of faith. He never believed that. Think of another uh, lady in our church uh, went through a really tough divorce. And she was a part of a, a big church in Perth, or Riverview, you know, Riverview. She was part of that. She was on their worship team. And they came to our church for a period of time. Marriage was in trouble anyway. He left and pretty nasty. And, and she shared this story, so it's not uh, confidential. And she said, I was sitting in the back row of our church one time. And she said, God, can you ever use me again? Can I ever be used for your kingdom again? And one of our um, staff then was, uh, you might remember Darren and Mel Crothers. You might have remember them. Mel's a, um, she's one of our, she was our worship uh, pastor then and she was awesome. And, and uh, she just gently got hold of Tam and just got her doing different aspects of behind the scenes stuff and just gently drew her out. Just gently drew her out. Now Tam, Tam's been through one of the worst years you could go through this last year, but um, she's on a key player in our worship, in our administration, and uh, God's released her into a new part of the journey. But she always remembers sitting in that back thinking, God, can I ever be used in your kingdom again? You know, Matthew is written particularly to a Jewish leader. To a Jewish reader, sorry. And Matthew, in writing this genealogy, including these four women, is really making a statement. He's making a statement that those who are considered the least in society, a Gentile woman, God sees very differently. God sees very differently, very special. He honors them. And to me, this reveals what God is like. God's not a God who sits out there and says, ah, you've done something wrong again. He's a God who's just defined by love and just pouring out grace and mercy and forgiveness on us all the time. So totally for us. He doesn't hold anything against us. You know, as you listen to these four stories, and you might be very familiar with them, um, we're in the stories. We're there. Always our story intersects with the stories of Scripture. So we don't look at the stories and think, oh, okay, so from what I learned from that is this is how I should live. It's almost like a picture of, no, this is, how I, this is who I am. <laughs> our stories intersect in some degree. They reveal who we are. Broken people with not much hope. But by the grace of God, we have hope. Now, if you keep reading in Matthew 1, you get to verse 16, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Oh, another woman mentioned here. Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. It's almost like in this list of ancestors, 
Matthew is doing the groundwork for the coming of the Messiah and for the naming of the Messiah. Jesus, Saviour, save people from their sins. You know, many ways these women and men in, in this passage reveal the mess of the Messiah's family. <laughs> the family tree of Jesus wasn't like a, a, a top, top rung. Jesus was not a man with a glorious family tree, broken, sinful people. So this Christmas... That's what we're looking at. We're looking at this season. This Christmas, remember, we come to Jesus in a mess. By the mercy and the grace of God, we enter into his family through faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Fairly simple, but life-changing. And we then become light and life dispensers. How good is that? We sang that song, we raise a hallelujah. We are life and light dispensers in a very dark and hurting world. Keep shining bright. Keep going for it. I just praise God that Jesus Christ came into the world full of grace and truth. Light in a dark world. Wherever you are, you light up the darkness. Believe that. Enjoy that. Look for the opportunities that God opens up. Thank God for his grace and mercy and keep living it out. And as I said, if you're not a Christian, today's a great day to do something about that. Today's a great day to say, Jesus, thank you. I want to give you my life so that I can be a life and grace and light dispenser. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for Jesus. And Lord, I, I thank you for this family tree that we read here today. The fact that it's definitely not perfect people. Father, it's broken people who need a lot of grace and, and mercy. And Father, thank you that that's us. Thank you that you drew us to yourself. Different, different ways, different circumstances, but you drew us to yourself. And Father, I pray by, your, by the power of your Holy Spirit that we'll continue to shine bright. This Christmas that we will continue to be a dispenser of grace and life and light to people. Lord, I pray for each one who lives in Mucca. Lord, that Mucca will continue to experience the light of Christ. That they experience the reality of Jesus. And that there will be many surprises this Christmas as people are overwhelmed by the revelation of who Jesus is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.